In this video, we're going to be creating two tools that will allow us to quickly design our levels. The first is going to be our level spawning tool. So if I were to center this and drag on one of the endpoints and hit Alt and left click. And we can even adjust the height of the road. There we go. And we can adjust its length by hitting by hitting 1200. So we adjusted its length. And the next tool is going to be our coin pickup spawning system. So if I were to center this as well, and by hitting on one of the endpoints and hitting Alt and left clicking, we can spawn our coins. And by adjusting this, by adjusting the spacing variable, we can choose how many coins it can spawn. So the smaller the number of spacing, the more number of coins it will spawn. The bigger the number of spacing, the less coins it will spawn. So by adjusting this to something like 400 and playing the level, we have our ball and we have our pickup coins. One thing we can also do by adding a jump pad, we can see the top part of this road. And this road was made completely in C++. If you're short on time, then I'll add the source code in a description below. You'll find it under the spawning folder. With that being said, let's create this uh, these tools. So now starting from where we last left off, I'm going to be creating a new class. And I'm going to be naming this new. I'm gonna, it's going to be an actor class. And we're going to be calling this road spawning system. And it's going to be under spawning folder. And so we're going to create that class. So now with the code compiled, the first thing we're going to be creating is a uSpline component. So uSpline component, and then spline component. And since this isn't automatically included, we're going to have to forward declare it. And a spline component is just this the spline component is just simply this this line here. So this will allow us to procedurally generate our road. So by dragging on this line, we see that our road is procedurally generated. So that's why we need the spline component. So back in the code. So we're gonna expose this to the editor, and we can do so by saying you property property edit anywhere. blueprint read write and we'll have this under a category and we'll call that category spline so in the constructor we're going to be creating this component so the first thing we're going to need is the header file and so the header file for the spline component is going to be include components dash spline spline component dot h. One thing we're also going to do is just remove any unnecessary functions. So since we're not using the tick or the begin play, I'm going to get rid of both of those. As we notice in our blueprint representation of the spawning system, every, everything was under the construction script in here. And the construction script activates every time we move the actor. We're going to be using the construction script in our C++ uh, to modify our spline. And the way we can do so is by overriding the base actor implementation of the construction script. And so I can say void, void on construction. And it's going to be const f transform. And a reference to a transform. And we're going to be overriding this implementation. So I'm going to be right clicking and then create implementation. So we have our on construction function. And we're going to get rid of these unnecessary functions in here, since we don't need them. So we have our constructor and we have our on construction. 
So just to create the spline in our constructor, all we would have to do is get the name of our spline, which happens to be spline component. And we will say create default sub object. And the data type, which is use spline component. We're going to add that to a text component. So with that, we would want to make our spline component the root component. We're going to be checking if the spline is defined. So just a quick check. We're going to we're going to be wanting to set the spline component to be the root, but we don't want it to be the root if the spline component hasn't been defined yet. So to check if it was defined, we're going to say if spline component. And in here, if it is defined, then we can say root component equals spline component. And that would be it for the construction uh, for the constructor. Now going into the construction script, we're going to be writing a for loop. And the for loop will start at index will be starting at zero. And now to determine and now to determine the last index, to figure out what our last index is, we're going to be taking a look at division. So in here, we have a spline of length 26,000, and we have each individual mesh, which we'll say is 200. The method we are, will be using to figure out how many meshes we should spawn in a spline length of 2,600, all we would have to do is take the length of the total spline, which would be 2,600, or 26,000, and we divide it by the length of each individual mesh, which is, in this case, 200. And that, what that will give us, so what we would get is 130. And this means that starting at index 0, we would need a total of 131 meshes to fit, uh, to fit the length of the spline. And the reason it's 131 is because the first index is 0. So it's 0 and then all the way up to 130. The reason it's one thir uh, 131 and not 130 is because we start at index 0. So including zero all the way up to 130 iterations, that will give us a grand total of 131 iterations. So 131 would be the number of meshes we would need to spawn in the spine to fill it up to the brim. The way we're able to get the length of the spine is by saying spline component And there we can say get spline length. And what we can do is divide it by each individual mesh. So I'm going to be creating a float or road width, setting that to 600 by default. So I want this road width to be modified in the editor. And the way I can do this is just by copying this U property and I'll just modify it so that I have edit anywhere and category is instead of spine, I'll name this road or street properties. And I misspelled edit anywhere. So I'll just fix that. And do the same for this. We have now that we have the road width, I can go into the for loop and say get the length of the whole spline and then divide it by the road width. And this will allow us to figure out what our last index should be. And we're going to say index plus plus. One thing too is I want this to be an integer values as such that I can figure out the last index of my spline length. So I can do this by calling a function in the f generic math library. So f generic f generic platform math trunk to int. 
There you go. And then I would drop that in here. Sure. So just to double check that I spelled this correctly, I'm just going to go to trunk to int and then hit F12 to see if it will find a definition. And it does. This is the part where some distinction between different data types in Unreal is going to be important. So we're going to go through that. So if we look at this diagram in here, so all these types are related to static meshes. There are three data types that we should be aware of and all relate to the static mesh. The first is the use static mesh component. The second is the use bind mesh component. And the third is the use static mesh. For our procedural road, we're going to be using a use spline mesh component. And the reason we're going to be using that is because the use spline mesh component contains a function inside of it called set start and end. And that will give us the ability to morph the shape of our road as the spline curves up or curves down. For creating our spawning system for the coins, we wouldn't need this functionality. And because of that, we wouldn't need the use spline mesh component. We would just need a use static mesh component because we don't need this additional functionality of set start and end node. Both the use spline mesh component and the use static mesh component contain a data type inside of it called the use static mesh. And the use static mesh, that's the mesh that gets rendered in the viewport. So if you were to see this in the editor, typically when you see a, a field that says static mesh, that will occur due to this use static mesh data type. Because of that, going to need a use static mesh in both the use spline mesh component and the use static mesh. So if we go into our header file, I'm going to be creating. So from here, we're going to have our three meshes. The first is going to be our use static, me uh, use static mesh. All of them will be type use static mesh. The first is our start road. The next will be our middle road, which will just be our middle section. And the last one and the last one will be our end road. I'm going to expose these, these data types to our editor. So by hitting Alt and left clicking, expose these variables to the editor. So I'm going to say U property, going to be edit anywhere. And blueprint read write. And the category will be street properties. just like how we had it for the road width. So now that I have my three road blocks, I'm going to be going into my for loop. I'm going to be creating a use spline mesh component. I'm going to be saying use spline mesh component. And it's going to be spline mesh component. And to create a new object, I just have to say new object. And it's going to be the type that I'm trying to create. So use spline mesh component. And from here, it's going to be the outer class, which is this. For the second argument, we're going to be saying use spline mesh component, colon, colon, static class. So from there, what I would want to do is define properties, defining properties of our spline mesh component. So the first is going to be whether it, whether it can be moved or not, allowing our mesh to move with our spline. All I would have to say is spline mesh component and I'm going to use a pointer or dereference and say set mobility and this is going to be E so if I if I hit F12 on it we'll notice that the argument it takes in is an E component mobility colon colon type so I can just copy that word paste it in 
a component mobility. And in here, I'm going to say the type is movable. Since we're creating this object in the construction script, to allow our, the engine to know that our mesh is being created in the construction script, I'm just going to copy this and paste it in. And all I would have to say, creation method. And in here, it's E component creation method and then colon colon user construction script so from there i'm going to register this component with the world to do that i would have to copy copy this name and paste it in register component with world and to register it with the world all I would have to do is get world and yeah that registers it with the world so I'm just gonna double check on the spelling if I hit F12 I think I misspelled this um mint with world there we go and from there i'm going to be attaching the spline that we just created or the spline mesh that we just created to our spline and to do that all we would have to say is copy this dereference it and say attach to component and the component we're attaching it to will be our spline component so that's going to be this data type that we just created in the constructor. So I'm going to copy that and paste it in. And then from there, I'm going to need to attach it with some transform. So I'm going to say the F attachment transform. F attachment transform rules will be keep relative transform. Hit F12 just to see if that's it's defined. Okay, so it is. Now what we would have to do is we would want to use the spline mesh component set start and end node. Our spline component will contain a function inside of it called set start and end node. Let's start and end. But we'll notice if we hit F12 on this function, it takes multiple inputs in. The first is going to be the start position. The second is the start tangent. The third is the end position. And the fourth is the end tangent. So going back to our editor, we'll notice this would be our start position, or this would be our start position, and this would be our end position. But the way we're treating it is our start position will be the first index, and our next, our end would be our second index. And the tangent will be this yellow yellow thing that we can drag in and out, which allows the mesh to curve. We need multiple arguments, the start position, the start tangent, the end position, and the end tangent. We're going to keep these all cons because they're not changing. First will be an F vector, and it will be our start position. We're going to, the way we're able to get the start position is we're going to take the spline and we're going to use a function inside of it called get location along spline. Location at distance along spline. So from there, the first argument it takes in, so if we hit F12, we'll notice the first argument it takes in is the distance, and the next argument is the coordinate space. So since our spline mesh component, as you can see in here, is attached to our spline component, that means wherever our spline component is moving, our spline mesh component will move with it. So relative to, so relative, we're going to keep the transform of our start position relative to the transform of our spline, our spline mesh component. So all we'd have to do is copy this word, e spline coordinate space, and paste that in. And we're going to keep it relative to the spline. So we're just going to set the coordinate space to local. 
As for the spacing, the way we're able to get the spacing is we're going to take our index, which is which is changing each iteration, and we're going to be multiplying it by a road width. So multiples of our road width is going to be added as our distance. In the first iteration, it will be zero, but on the second iteration, it will be 600. And we're just going to be copying this and pasting it. Or the next one will be our start tangent. And the only difference in here for our tangent is we're going to be calling a different function and we're going to say get tangent at distance along spline. So this gets us our start tangent and our start position. And all we would have to do to get our end tangent and our end position is if we were to copy these two arguments, and this will be called end pause, and this will be called end tangent. So instead of saying just index, we're going to be using the next point as our last position. So instead of it just being index, it's going to be index plus one. And then multiplied by the road width. So index plus one to represent our next index. made a mistake this was our start tangent so we wouldn't need the plus one there there we go so now for our arguments the first argument it takes in so the first argument is the start position then the start tangent then the end position then the end tangent and it says as the very last one be update mesh and we're going to set that to true start position start tangent end position and tangent. We're going to set the last argument to true uh, to allow the mesh to update. So from there, now that we have our set start and end mesh, we're going to need to call two more functions. The first will be the collisions. So we want to allow our mesh to have to have collisions. And the way we're able to do this is we're going to copy the name. And in here, we're going to say set collisions enabled and the collision type will be from there all we would have to say is e collisions enabled colon colon query in physics so it's e collision instead of e collisions from so now that we have our set collisions so now from there we're going to be writing code for choosing what mesh to render. So now we're going to be choosing what mesh to render in the screen. So if the start road is defined and the index is zero, that means we're at the very beginning of the for loop. And in that situation, we would want to render our start mesh. Our spline mesh component contains this use static mesh, and we're just setting that to be the start road. Our index is zero and our start road is defined. In that situation, I want to set the spline mesh component and I'm going to be setting its static mesh to be the start road. OK, so that deals with this, uh, that deals with the start road. So now we're going to be checking for the last index. So we're going to render the, the end road if we happen to be at the last index. So if the end road is defined and to determine when we're at the last index, that's going to be when our index is equal to this condition that we have here. I just grab that and copy it. And we know it's going to be at the last index when this condition is true. So all I'd have to do is paste that in. And from there, we take the spline mesh component. We're going to set its static mesh to be the end road. 
So otherwise, if it's neither the start index nor the end index, so if it's neither the start index nor the end index, what we would want to do is check if the middle road is defined. Check if the middle road is defined. If that is the case, so if it's neither the start nor the end index, then we have to assume that it's the middle index. So in that in those situations, all we're going to render is the middle road. There you go. And one last thing we can do just to make our design slightly more flexible is to allow the designer to define what the forward axis of our mesh is. So in most cases, the forward axis tends to be the X, but in some situations where assets get exported to Unreal, their forward axis tends to be Y or Z. So in those situations, we can uh, allow our procedural road to be more flexible by allowing the user to define what the forward axis is. So to do so, all we would need in the header file, we would have t enum as byte, and it's going to be e spline mesh axis colon colon type. And from there, I'll just define this to be the forward axis. And to allow the users to specify what the forward axis is, we're just going to co copy this and paste it in. And now in the set collisions, so where we set our collisions, we're also right after what we're going to do is set the forward axis. So I'm going to co uh, copy this and I'm going to say set forward axis and the forward axis in this case will be forward axis and we're going to set it to true so if we look at the set forward axis and the first argument is the forward and update of the mesh so update it when we change the forward axis so from here i just forgot a bunch of semicolons so i'm gonna just add that in semicolon I think that would be it for our procedural road so we're going to compile this and see if it it compiles so it's complaining that it doesn't know what a spline mesh component is so it doesn't know what a spline mesh component is and normally I would include this in the header file but because in our t enum as byte array it also depends on that definition. So for that reason, I'm going to be including this in the header file of our road spawning system. So in the header file, I'm going to say include components dash spline mesh component in there. Okay, so I had a uppercase issue. So it's uppercase S and that should fix that error. We noticed that I said spline, but then really it was spline mesh component, or really it was spline component. So I'm just going to copy that and then paste that in here. So I'm going to say spline component, and I'm going to be pasting that for all of them. Here, we have spline component. So let's compile that and see if that fixes the errors. And here we have our spine mesh component and it's complaining about set collisions enabled is not a member, which means I misspelled it. Collisions. And oh, it's without an S enabled. So I said collision enabled. So that should fix that issue. So the last mistake was pretty dumb. So in here, I'm going to say a road spawning system and just have that there. There we go. So with that, I've declared my constructor. And then from there, compile and see if that worked. OK, so compile to the editor. And now we're going to be testing this out. OK, so in our levels two folder, actually what I'll do is I'll create a new level. So a new level, default, I'll get rid of this. And I'll call this level three. I'll save this under our levels folder. 
So in level three, now what we can do is go into our C++ classes under the spawning and right click under road spawning system and create blueprint base class. And I'll just name this TPP spawning system. And I'll just have this under the spawning system. So we notice we have our spline and we have our start road, our end road, our middle road and our end road. And we also have our forward axis. So if we were to click on our assets that we created, the first one will be our SM underscore start road. The next will be our middle road, uh, level assets, SM underscore straight road. Here we go. And the third will be our end road, SM underscore end road. So now that we have our assets, I'm going to compile this and save it. And I'm going to drag this to the level. So we notice we have our start road. So if I were to click and drag, we notice now that we have we have our, our start road and we can drag and also extend up and change the length to be maybe around 1200 units. There we go. So now that we have our spawning system, I'm just going to quickly review the system we made in general, uh, just so that you can go back to the section if you just want to look at something really quick. So the first thing we did was we created our spine component. Our, sp our spine component was of type use spine component pointer, and we have it under the category spline. The next is we defined a road width, and our road width was used in our for loop. To determine how many iterations it should loop through in this for loop, we truncated that result to make it an index. We took our spline length, which was whatever length we've dragged it in, and, div and divided by the road width. And in our for loop, we used a spline mesh component and not a, a static mesh component because the spline mesh component contained a function called set start and end, which allowed us to morph the shape of our mesh. We attached our spline mesh component to our spline. And because of that, we can keep our transforms relative to the spline. And we use the creation method to be a construction script uh, because we are creating our mesh within the construction script. And this is not to be confused with the constructor, uh, which is just a default concept in C++. This is an on construction script, which is something specific to Unreal, uh, which gets run every time the transform of the object changes. We then select which mesh that we want by saying, by looking at the index and then doing set static mesh, you'll notice that the start road, end road, and middle road are all of type use static mesh. The use static mesh doesn't have the ability to, doesn't have the ability to set its collisions or anything of that sort. It just has the ability to render something in the screen. The way we handle con collisions is through the spline mesh component, uh, which is its parent component essentially. With that out of the way, now we're gonna be creating our procedural spawning system. To create our coin spawning system, we're going to go into add new, new C++ class. And then we're going to do actor. And from here, we're going to keep this in the spawners folder. So I'm just going to double check the spawning folder. And I'm going to name this coin spawning system. And then I'll create the class. So now I'm going to get rid of the unnecessary functions. In this class, we don't need the tick event, so I'll get rid of that. We will be using the begin play to spawn our actors, so we'll leave that in. And yeah, so let's get rid of, let's set this to false, and let's get rid of the tick event. So now with that out of the way, like what we did with our road spawning system, where we created the spine mesh component, we're going to be doing the same thing for our coin spawning system. So we're going to, we're spawning our coins along the length of a spline. So that would mean we would need a spline component. So we can get that from here. I'll just copy what we did 
for the procedural road and have it in our coin spawning system. And I'll also copy the header file. So we needed the spine component. And yeah, so that's that does it for the constructor. Now it's different in the begin play. We're using the begin play to spawn our actors, our pickup actors. And the way we're going to spawn our pickup actors is by spawning them along the length of the spine. So the way we're going to do that is we're going to have an index similar to what we did with our, we're going to have an index like what we did with our procedural road. And then we're going to say, well, that index is less than or equal to, and it will be the same conditions we had for our procedural road. So we're going to truncate the value and take the length of the spline divided by the length of each road section. But in this case, it's not necessarily the road section, but rather the spacing. So instead of us having a road width, like what we did with our uh, procedural road, we're going to be using a spacing instead. We're going to be naming this spacing. Spacing. And here's why. So if we go into our division notes, we'll notice that for the road length, each mesh was of width 200. Whereas for our coin spawning system, we'll have our spline, which is maybe 1800. And we have our coin, which is of some length. But what we're going to do is take the spacing between each coin from another. So if we if we were to treat the spacing to be 400, then we'll have 18,000 divided by 400. And then that that would just give us 45. And since the first index, since we're including the first index, all the way to the last index, that would mean we would have 46 iterations in total. Uh, since the first is at zero, so it starts at zero. So we'll spawn this at zero, then it will uh, then it will spawn 45 others. So instead of us treating it as a road section, where the length is actually 200, we're we're treating it as spacing, to uh, to figure out how far each coin should be away from each other. So going into our code, so we have our spacing. So in here, we're going to be dividing by our spacing. So take the length of the whole. Um, take the length of the whole spline and divide it by the spacing to figure out how many coins should fit in, within that spline. And then we're going to do an increment. So index plus plus. From here, the way we're able to spawn actors within the level is by going into our header tool and defining a field called t subclass of. I have t sub class of. And then the type of actor we're trying to spawn. Since I'm trying to spawn a pickup, which was defined in my interactions folder in here, they're in here. I'm going to choose a pickup. But if you're trying to keep things as general as possible, then you would probably just spawn an A actor. But for in my case, I'm going to spawn a pickup since that's a class I use to define my interaction component or interaction coins. It's going to be forward declaration class A pickup. And it's going to be the name coin we we're spawning. Alternatively, you could have said a actor, and that would have worked just fine. But I'm trying to make things as specific as possible, so it would be easier to find within the editor. I'm going to expose this to the editor. I'm going to use a macro, u property, and in here, I'm going to say edit defaults only, and I would give the category spline. So this, just to reiterate, is for spawning our actor. OK, so going back into our begin play, we're going to be using a function. And this function is going to be called get world. Within get world, it contains a function called spawn actor. And this allows our actor to be, and this allows our actor to be spawned. And the type of actor we're spawning, in this case, will be an A pickup. So since we're spawning an A pickup, I'm just going to include its header file. So I'm going to say include dot dot slash interaction and dash pickup. 
There we go. So in our spawn actor, it takes in four arguments. So the first argument is the actor we are spawning. In this case, as I've defined in my header file, the actor I'm spawning is the coin coins we are spawning. So in, so the first argument will be coin we are spawning. And the second argument will be the location of the coin. And the way we're able to get the location of the coin is by saying f vector. I'm going to store this in a variable called coin location. And it's going to be spline component. And in here, I'm going to use an arrow, get location at distance along spline. So from here, I'm going to pass in the index and I'm going to multiply it by the spacing. The spacing will be increments of each other. So on the first iteration, the index is zero and the spacing is 600, which means that the lo location of the coin will be at zero. But this next iteration, the index is one and the spacing is 600. So that would mean that the distance will be 600 away from the first one. So it goes in increments of the spacing. So we have that. And then we're going to have to define the spline coordinates. So we're going to say E spline coordinate space. And since since our spawned actors are not attached to the spline, that would mean that their location wouldn't be relative to the spline. So in that sense, we would use a world coordinate space. So we're going to do that for our coin location. And we're going to do the same for its rotation. So get rotation. at distance along spline. And like our location, its coordinate will be world since it's not attached to the spline. If it was attached, then its coordinate space would be local. So the second argument we're passing into our spawn actor is going to be the coin location. And the second argument is the coin rotation. And the, fir and the fourth argument will be the spawn parameters. And we can define our spawn parameters and we can define our spawn parameters by saying f actor spawn parameters spawn param and the last argument uh, just allows our actor to define parameters in which the actor can be spawned in so we're going to make sure that the actor we're spawning is actually defined and the way we can check for that is by saying if actor or if coin we are spawning as in the user def, uh, the user already assigned what coin we're spawning in the editor if that's defined then we're going to execute this logic one thing i would also want to check for is if the world is defined because otherwise it would crash in this in line 30. so if get world is defined then execute all this other code. So I'm going to just drag everything in here and just drag it into the world. So yeah, that's it. That's uh, all the code we need to spawn our actors. This will spawn our interactive pickup coin actors. We're just going to compile that and build it. So I forgot that we're getting the rotation. So that would mean I would change this to coin rotation. And that would also mean that the data type would be F rotator. When we're spawning undeclared identifier, let me copy it one more time. When we're spawning, oh, I misspelled this. Let's build it. Okay, so now that it compiled, I'm just going to compile this on the editor and have it refresh everything. Okay, so now that it compiled, we're going to go back to the editor and we're going to create we're going to create a blueprint based class. So we're going to right click into the coin spawning system, blueprint class, and say CPP underscore coin spawning system. So in here, we're going to 
left click. And so now we have our spawn component and we can even choose the coin we were spawning. And this was, and this was what we defined in here. This T subclass of coin we were spawning. Had you had this be an actor, you would see this dropdown be a lot larger. But since I only defined this to be of a type a pickup class or a subclass of that, that would mean that only pickup class or child classes of the pickup class can be chosen into this field. So for that, I can choose my BP underscore pickup. And if I were to compile that, this is going to spawn our pickup coins that we have in here and drag this in. We'll notice that off the bat, there's no coins that it's rendering in the in the viewport, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it's not spawning coins. So if I were to hit play, we'll notice that it spawns a coin that we can interact with. And so the reason it doesn't show up in our viewport is because everything, all the code we wrote for our spawning system, or at least for our coin spawning system, is under the begin play function, which means that this code won't execute until we start the game by hitting this play button. So if I were to hit play, we'll notice there's coins we can interact with. And yeah, so if you're trying to get it such that the designer can both spawn the coins as well as look at how the coins will be, as in have placeholder meshes to act in the spot of where the coins would spawn, then we can do so by going back into our code and modifying our construction script and having it so that the construction script would spawn a placeholder mesh that would act in in place of our coin. So this way that they so that by doing so, you can it would be easier for them to know where the coins would what the coins would look like when they're along this mesh instead of having to play the game and predict how the coins will look like as you play the game. So going back into our code, the way we're able to have a placeholder mesh is by going back into our header file and adding by adding a static mesh and then we'll call the static mesh placeholder mesh. It's going to be use static mesh and this is the mesh that gets rendered in the level and this mesh is essentially the placeholder mesh placeholder mesh. And this mesh will give the designer an idea of how the coins will look like before they even hit the begin play function. So we're going to expose this mesh to the editor, like what we did with our other classes or with our other components. What we can then do is use our construction script that we used in our, our road spawning system. So that's this one right here. So we're going to copy that and then we're going to play and we're going to place it into our header file. And so we're going to create an implementation by right clicking, create implementation. So on construction, so on construction, what we're going to do is we're first going to check if the user has defined the placeholder mesh. And we can do so by going in and putting the placeholder mesh and just say if the placeholder mesh is defined. While we're on that topic, we should also do the same thing for our road mesh. So in the on the construction, we don't want to execute any of this code if the user hasn't defined a start road mesh. So if he hasn't picked a road uh, a mesh to render, then we don't want it to execute any of this code. So what we can do is just say if start road is defined and just have that encapsulate uh, if the start road is defined. If it's if it's defined or if the start road, so if the start road is not defined, that would mean it's a null pointer. And in that case, just return from the function. We don't want you to execute any of the other function. Uh, we don't want you to execute any of the other instructions. So if the placeholder mesh is a null pointer, as in they haven't assigned anything in the editor, so. This will be true when the user hasn't assigned any mesh within the editor. So 
one here, I can say return. If this is not the case, then we're going to do our for loop. And for int uh, index is equal to zero, index less than, and it will be the same for loop we had for our begin play. So all I'm going to do is I'm going to copy this. and paste it in. And I'm going to say less than or equal to. So index plus plus. So for this um, placeholder mesh that we're going to be spawning into our level, we're going to be creating a static mesh. In the static mesh, it's going to be static mesh component. And in the static mesh component, it will contain a use static mesh, which is a thing that, get, that gets rendered in the level. And we're choosing a static mesh component as opposed to a U. Uh, we're choosing a static mesh component as opposed to a use blank mesh component because we don't need this extra functionality of, of using set start and end. We don't necessarily need, we don't need that because we're just trying to spawn a coin in each spacing multiple. So with that, we can go back into our code and say placeholder mesh is going to be equal to new object. And this new object is going to be a use static mesh, static mesh component, and then this and you static mesh component colon colon static class. So from there, we're going to define a set of parameters like what we've done with our procedural road. And so the first one is going to be the mobility. So allowing our mesh coins to move with the spline. So to do that, we're going to take our placeholder mesh and dereference it and say set mobility and that's going to be E component mobility colon colon movable. There we go. And now we're going to set the creation method like what we did with our like what we did with our road. So the creation method in here was user construction script, and it's going to be the same for our spine mesh. And I'm going to name this place holder mesh. Now we're going to do, we're going to register the component. So placeholder mesh register component, and we're going to register it with the get world. So we're registering our, our mesh that we're putting into our spline with the world. And from here, we're going to attach our mesh to our spline. So attaching our mesh to our spline. So we're going to take this and instead we're going to say attach component and the component we're trying to attach to is a spline component. And since we're, we have attached it to our spline component, that means wherever our spline will move, our static mesh will move with it. So with that being said, all I would have to do is say f attachment f attachment transform rules colon colon keep relative transform and now we're going to need to spawn our mesh into the level spawning or rendering our mesh 
into the level. And we can do so by saying placeholder mesh and set static mesh. And now it's going to be the static mesh that we have defined in here. So the static mesh, I also named it placeholder mesh. So I'll just rename this rendered placeholder mesh. So going back into here, so this is the rendered placeholder mesh. But the thing is, as it is right now, our coin is attached to the to the spline, but the transforms of our coin will all be spawned into one point because we haven't dis made any distinction between the location and rotation between each coin. So the way we're able to do this is by using our spline. So in here, our spline, we're going to take that. We're getting the location of each coin within the spline. So we're able to do so by saying spline component get location at distance along spline and the distance will be the index multiplied by the spacing and from here we can say e spline coordinate space and then it will be local it will be a local coordinate space since the coin is attached to the spline so it's going to be local to the location of the spline. So in here, we're going to do the same thing, but then we're going to say get rotation at distance along spline. And I'm going to store these uh, commands in two variables. So the get location will return, will return an F vector. So I'm going to use an F vector and it's going to be coin location. I'm going to do the same for here. F rotator coin rotation. As so this gets us the position of our coin within the mesh. So now we need to use that and using the values we just retrieved We're going to say placeholder mesh. Since the placeholder mesh is a thing that got attached to the spline, we're just going to say it's rotation. So set place, uh, placeholder mesh and then set relative location. And that would be coin location. And we're also going to say set relative rotation and we're going to say coin rotation and again we're using this we're using this because uh, we're trying to spawn the coins in the right coordinate within the spline which means that we we get that coordinate through this get lo get lo this location at distance along spline and we know it's local since it's local to the spline and then from there we're setting it within our placeholder mesh. Uh, if you haven't, if you don't do this, what it's going to do instead is just spawn all the coins or all the placeholder meshes in one geolocation within the viewport. And that's not what we're trying to do. So varying, varying the location and rotation of each coin based off where it lives within the spline. That's what we're trying to do in this set relative location. And then once we have done that, then we can just set the static mesh. And yeah, now there is one issue with this. I'll compile this and then we can fix it once uh, we see the issue in the viewport. Okay, so I made a silly mistake. I said register component, but really it's register component with world and in this attached component 
it's attached to component. There you go. And that should fix those two errors. Okay, and also since I renamed this rendered placeholder mesh, I'm just gonna do so in this if condition as well. And build that. Okay, so compiled. And now I'm just gonna compile this in the editor. Okay, so now that I compiled, I'm gonna go back into the editor and see if the system works. So I'm gonna just delete that and I'm gonna right click and create a blueprint based class. I am just gonna name this. I'm just reparenting this just to test out the new features. Coin spawning system. So we have the rendered placeholder mesh and the coin we're spawning, so we're spawning the pickup coin. And the rendered placeholder mesh, so we're just gonna say cylinder. And we'll notice, so we're reminded that if we play this, it spawns the coins within the right location. But if I were to play this, we'll notice that it's just a placeholder mesh. So we can't necessarily interact with this. So what we would want to do on the begin play is destroy all these placeholder meshes because they serve their purpose in that they show where the actual coins are being spawned. So this placeholder mesh and this actor coin that's within it are two different uh, components, but they're placed within the same location uh, just to show that this is just to show the designer that this is where in fact, the coins will be spawned. Going back into VS Code, the first thing we're going to do is destroy the components in begin play. But we can't do so because right now we don't have a reference to the coins that are being spawned within the for loop. So the way we're able to keep track of the static meshes that are being spawned within this for loop in here is we're going to add a T array. So T array. And it's going to be array. It's going to be an array of static meshes. So essentially what we're going to do is store all the static meshes into one place and destroy them when we have to. So the destruction of the static meshes will occur on begin play. The one thing though is that, so I'm going to have this coin collection. And I'm just going to have a macro, but instead of having it edit anywhere, I'm just going to have it visible anywhere. Just because I want to see it, I don't edit it. We want to make sure that the, the array of coins that we have is the most updated construction script because we have to know the construction script will run each time the object is moved. And if we allow our array to keep adding within each construction script, then it's going to have a lot of trash data. If we were to save an array of, let's say, five coins, and then once we move our coin object by one unit up or down, then it's going to have the five coins that it already stored in within the construction script. But in addition to that, it's going to be another five from the previous run. So we want to clear out all the coin arrays that we have within our previous run and just store the last run of our construction script. The way we can do that is let's say coin collection, coin collection, and then dot empty, just to empty out the array within each run of the construction script. And then at the very end, we can store the values for our array. Just going to comment this. Uh, we want to clear the coin array. So it only saves the placeholder meshes from the last run of the construction script. There we go. So now within our for loop, what we're going to do is we're going to add this where we do the static meshes and we have all that. I'm going to say coin collection at the very end of the for loop. I'm going to say coin collection and I'm going to say in place. You could use add. You could use add, 
But the problem with add is that it will add a temporary variable. So the procedure for which it adds to the array is more costly. The rule, the general rule of thumb is if the array you have in your T array, if the data type you have is a primitive, like an int or a float, um, then you would use the add function, but otherwise you would use in place, uh, just because it saves, it's less costly than add. Uh, but yeah, this is just adding an element within our place within our array. So now with that done, I'm just going to go in and compile this and see if that works. Okay, so it compiled properly. So now what I can do, once I'm in the begin play function, the first thing I'm going to do is do a for each loop to destroy each of the static meshes that were stored within our coin collection. So after the super begin play, I'm going to say for each u static mesh, mesh component. So this is the data type and it's going to be mesh coin. It's just the name I gave it for this, uh, like how we named our index for our for loop. And then it's going to be the thing I'm looping through and that's going to be the coin collection. And on each iteration, what I want to do is take the mesh coin and destroy it. So destroy component. There we go. And then that should destroy our mesh coin. So I'm going to compile that just to see if it works. So it compiled. So now I'm just going to compile it to the editor and then test it out. So now that it compiled, I'm going to go back into the editor and get rid of this. Also get rid of this actor. I'm going back into my spawning system. I'll just get rid of the coin spawning system just to refresh everything and reparent it. So my coin spawning system, I'll just prefix this with the CPP and have this under the spawning system folder. So with that, I'm just going to pick the coin. So coin we're spawning is a pickup coin. And then cylinder is the thing we're using the placeholder mesh for. Rendered placeholder mesh. So now if we take our coin, we notice it spawns in the level. And if we drag by hitting Alt and left clicking, we notice it spawns more coins and we can also drag it up and push it here and then also modify the spacing. Let's say have it around 300. So it will spawn more coins. And then if I were to hit play, we notice we have our coins that we can interact with. So we have our coins and the placeholder meshes get deleted. Just a quick review of everything we built within the coin spawning system. We have three functions, the constructor, which we use to create our, our spawn component, like what we did with our procedural road. We have this on construction script, but I would say this is more of, um, I would say not necessary unless you're trying to make this your level designer. So yeah. I wouldn't say this is really essential um, to have this placeholder mesh just so that your designer would know how the coin would look like as you spawn it within the level. Um, but if you're trying to make it more convenient for him, then yeah, it would be it would it would it would be more of a feature than than like a necessity. Whereas for spawning our actual coin within the game, then we have we use everything with within the begin play. So the first thing we do within the begin play is delete all the all the meshes that we have spawned within the construction script. And once we have done that, then we proceed to go through this for loop to spawn each individual mesh. It's important to note that the coins we're spawning within the begin play are different than the coins we're spawning within the mesh. They just so happen to be in the same location. And the way we're able to achieve this is for the construction script, we have this the e spine coordinate is local to the spline, whereas the spline for the 
begin play is world because it's not connected to our spline. Um, and then the way we're actually able to spawn our actor is by using this function called get world. And then in there, there's a spawn actor function. We used the a pickup, but then we could have used uh, we could have used a more general data type and say just a actor instead of a pickup. And in that case, we wouldn't have to forward declare it like class a pickup. With that, we can we choose the um, the coin we're responding, which is just the name we have for our T sub class of. And then from here, we just provide the actor's location and its rotation. And we were able to get this through the spline. So that wasn't bad. And then once we have done that, we also can define certain parameters to which the actor can be spawned in. And that goes within our F actor spawn parameters. So once we have done that, when we test it out in the level, we notice everything seems to work. And yeah. So if you have any questions, we notice it also deletes the actor within as it's interacting with them. Um, so if you have any questions, please let me know in the comments below. Um, yeah. And with that being said, the next videos might be focusing on more widget stuff. So be on the lookout for that. All right. Have a good day.